Welcome to Restoration Ministry streaming live from Connorsville, Indiana. Make yourself at home. Cold drinks and coffee are in the worship well. If you take the last cup, please make more or turn off the coffee pot. We also have new calendars on the back table. Noontime prayer will be canceled this week. Tonight, Wade will be teaching about higher. If you're online, send your prayer requests during the sermon. Next week, October 10th, Wade will have a guest speaker, Richard Sleet. We'll also have discipleship class. Tonight's teaching will be on the old gate. Next week's assignment is the valley gate. Our guest speaker for next Monday, October 10th, will be Amanda Sleet. Also on October the 10th, we'll have a guest worship leader, which will be Debbie Dye. Worship starts at 5.15 p.m. Come out and join us for a powerful time in the glory. Discipleship class begins at 7.15 tonight. There will be a brief pause after Wade is finished with his teaching. If you're joining us online, we will also broadcast that class on Wade and Connie's Facebook page. For those of you who are staying here at the Resource Center, help yourself to the treats that will be bought out between classes. Also, let Connie know if you want to be part of discipleship class. Books will be provided. If you don't receive outlines or other mailings, please let us know. Um, from October 6th through 8th, Vonda Bishop Ministries will have an empowering women's conference at Crossfire Church, 1940 West Elkton Road in Hamilton, Ohio. We also have a text to give number, which is 833 758-0290. Again, that text to give number is 833-758-0290. And we do appreciate your giving. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. We appreciate all of you who've joined us in person and those who are online. And I'm going to ask, this might be something that pushes her outside her comfort zone, but I'm going to ask Marcia if she would pray us in tonight. She's a quiet lady, but I just feel like she, it's her that needs to do that tonight. Okay. Our Father and our God, we just lift everyone up to you tonight, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. You've helped us get through another day. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I lift up all the prayer requests before we even know. Um, pray that there will be healing, there will be clarification and understanding. Lord, we thank you for giving us the insight into your word. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. And while I'm over here, we had some words of knowledge tonight during worship. I'm going to start with Sherry since I'm here beside her. Well, what I felt tonight was just, I'm a crier in worship anyway, but this was, this was intense. I felt a, a blanket of love in there this evening, and I just felt the presence of God's love for us so overwhelming. This is what I wrote down. So many living and missing this chance to be loved in this way by him. So many living in torment, anguish. When all they have to do is cry out to Jesus, he is waiting for you. Amen. Awesome. Good I word. felt that really thick love, too. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Mary, why don't you come up here so that you can, I can hold this for you and you can use your hands to tell your story. <laughs> I was wondering how I was going to do that. <laughs> so um, tonight I saw two hands and it was like they were in a fist bump, but it was backwards and they were red. And so when this one came in, this one kind of backed up. And then as this one came in, this one got bigger and bigger. And as this one disappeared, the black that was between them just took over and there was nothing more of this one. And this was just a big, ferocious hand. And at first, when I saw it, I thought it was um, us and it was us and the other countries and they were coming at us and we just kind of ran. And so that's what kind of felt like, like the we were allowing we weren't standing our ground, but we were allowing others to take over. 
So um, that's kind of what I felt. And then Sherry had a different interpretation than what I felt, so. Okay. <laughs> I just felt immediately that it was a spirit spirit related in the hands and, and I saw it as two Christians and I had asked Mary you know which was the bigger hand because I felt like the right hand was more dominant and she did say it was the right hand was bigger that I felt like that it was more mature Christians trying to come alongside maybe more of the immature babes in Christ but there was a lot of resistance a lot of resistance, so I, I really didn't get much from that, but I'm sure the Lord will give me more on it because I'm inquisitive and wanting to know when he doesn't give me the whole picture. But there was like a resistance there, and all I felt was there was the stronger one, the more mature one, but this other one here was just not not having it. Like they wanted to go their own course in a sense, do it their own way, and rather than like listening at all to maybe the more mature uh, wisdom. Amen. Mary, why don't since that was your revelation, why don't you pray both ways? By the way, is it okay for a word of knowledge or another revelation from the Lord to have more than one interpretation? Yes. Absolutely. So those two and any others. God, we are just coming to you right now that we are just what you reveal, Lord, we need to take care of. If that's us backing um, off because we don't want the confrontation, Lord, then just stand us up in you. And as Christians, we need to be learning from others, and iron sharpens iron, and Lord, and we are just calling forth that sharpening right now in our country, Lord, and Christians, that they would just want to get stronger in you, Lord, that they would um, not buck against those that are trying to give them knowledge, but so that they could see and accept those things that they haven't learned yet, Lord, because we are learning every day if we allow you to let us learn. And we just thank you that you are opening up our eyes, Lord, that um, this may be something one of us is dealing with, that we've been bucking the system because we don't want to learn it, because we don't want to listen to that person that's telling us that. But Lord, we, when you tell us something through someone, we should listen. And we just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to your truths tonight. And that if this is a worldview that we are backing down because we don't want to uh, put up a fight when our Christianity is at, at, at the door, that we don't need to step backwards. We need to step forward in you, Lord. We just ask that you would strengthen us, guide us in the way that we should go. And we just ask that you would just give us that mentality of, I don't care who else says, I'm going after what God has for me. And I thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary. I had some um, physical, but one of, one of mine that was not physical, the Lord wants somebody for us to pray for somebody who needs focus in their lives. And so when we pray, if that's you, if that's some of your kids or someone else that just isn't focused, we're going to pray that way. I saw an, an issue right at the top of the neck, and I don't even know how to describe it because it wasn't, it was, there was just something there right here where the chin, underneath the chin, um, then Someone, I saw a curved spine, and um, I'm, I'm going to get in on that prayer because I still have issues with mine as a result of what happened to me last year. So, Also, there's um, a pain in the side, but also a pain in the middle of the abdomen, but a little to the side that I felt. And... Um, then someone has difficulty taking deep breaths. So um, if that's anybody, if any of those, including the focus in life, is somebody in here, I'm going to have Wade pray over us because I want prayed over too. And um, let's come up here and let's remember uh, to look this way or that way toward the camera and people can... Tickle in my throat. Okay. It's just 
maybe a little lower than you pointed to, but it's my voice just well, is affected. Well, thank you, Jesus. Bonnie? Tyler, I need you to bleep. It doesn't work. And the curvature spine. of the spine. Spine for her, too. Yeah. Okay. They said it's, a, a, it's to the side. All right. I'm Praise God. Hold hands with each other. Hold hands with each other. Praise God. You need a Holy Ghost mug in this. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Lord, we're calling on your covenant promise right now for divine health and healing that you already bought and paid for. We're releasing it right now and we're receiving it together. Lord, we're agreeing that it is ours. We're receiving it now. And we know that what you reveal, you've already healed. And so we're receiving that now in Jesus' name. Marsha, we're declaring your, your hip healed tonight as well. And we thank you, Father, for every autoimmune disease right now that people are suffering from. Diabetes in particular. I'm naming diabetes tonight. We're coming against that mess once and for all. And we thank you, Father, for extracting that root, that root, of self-rejection and self-hatred. And I thank you, Father, for filling that void with your love tonight and demonstrating your love through your healing virtue now in Jesus' name. Resurrection power flow right now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I pray that for everyone that's watching right now that says that, yeah, I, that, that describes me with that, that word of knowledge. So be healed in Jesus' name. Receive it tonight. What the Lord showed me during the worship was that there are those who have not fully entered in to this life in Christ because they don't know if they can trust Him or not. They bought into the religious nonsense that came out of the Garden of Eden that distorted view of who God is. And they're not sure if they can trust Him. They really believe that He's out to punish them. So I'm, I, I'm releasing right now the truth of God's Word that He is a God who's going to dissolve doubts right now. And He does that through healing your body. He does that through miracles. He does it through the gifts of Holy Spirit, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. He, he's doing it right now for those that just have a hesitancy you know, you know you should, but you just don't fully trust Him. So I pray you step into that reality right now. Step into Him. He can be trusted. Beyond all else. I can't be trusted, but He can. He can. Glory to God. You can't be trusted, but He can. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else have anything? Before you begin. Ben, for a boil. So, Father, we come against that, that infection right now, that boil. Those things are painful. So, Father, we're just, say, be dissolved and dry up now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Demonstrate your love to Ben like, never, like, like he's never really felt before, that he's, he actually feels your presence right now. Thank you for that, Father. Well, praise the Lord. Well, I'm going with higher again tonight. Is anybody getting anything from, from this series? Because this series is going to go on for a while. Um, how many, how many want to go higher? Who, who's not afraid of heights in here? Okay, good, good. I'm glad you're not afraid of heights. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. Well, uh, let me flip this around here. I've got some notes up here. And I don't know if everybody can see them or not. Beth, can you see them? You always get in that pre precarious position. I know. I have to sit how, about, how, about, how about you, Chase? Can you see it? Okay, good, good. Everybody can see it, right? Except Connie. She's back there and she could, yeah. Not, whoa. That was the oil? Where'd it go? Okay, good, good, good. Well, praise God. There you go. Uh, Philippians. Chapter 3, and there's seven verses there I want to start with. 
We're going higher today. Who's got the, oh, here it is. Who wants to read that for me? Philippians chapter 3, 7 through 14. And I want you to read it real loud. Whoever's going to do it for me. All right, Mary. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet also, yet indeed also, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being comforted to his, conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, do not count your, myself to have apprehended, but, I one thing, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Good. Thank you, Mary. So there's a lot in that. That's Paul just giving his, his heart, just speaking his heart right out. And he, he says, look, he, was, he called himself a Pharisee of Pharisees, didn't he? Remember Paul? If you were a Pharisee, number one, you had, a bit, had to have been married by the age of 30. By the age of 30. You had to have been married. So when he said he lost all things, he lost it. his family. He lost it for the cause of Christ. He was disasso totally disassociated from his family, from everything he had. It, it, you know, he, he was zealous for the law and wanted to persecute those people that were deceived who loved Jesus until he became a lover of Jesus. And he said that he pressed forward. But he was pressing forward to understand this word right here. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was pressing forward. The resurrection, the entire gospel hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many know that? The entire gospel hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, in order for us to go higher, we need to understand more than we already do about the resurrection. I'm going to make a statement, and I'm not going to back up from it, because I know it's true. Most of the church considers the cross and the resurrection nothing more than a historical event that has re rarely any relevance in their life today. So much so that it's been turned over to a cute little bunny rabbit laying chocolate eggs for the kids. Trivialized. When it is the most important human event that ever happened, including creation. In creation, God, Jesus, who was the Word, Created everything from nothing. Did he not? Yes. Well, at the resurrection, God went into death and brought Jesus out. Totally superior. This is the most, this is the most incredible event that ever happened. It marked the death of death itself. The death of death. Over. And done with. No wonder Paul wanted to. One thing he, he he's pressing on to this higher, higher, this upward call. He wants to go higher, just like we want to go higher, like I want to go higher. 
in Him. I want to go higher in the knowledge of Him. And guess what? He said, I, never have, I haven't attained yet. Well, none of us have. There's always more of Him for us to have, to understand, to have living in us and through us. So, what actually happened here? Well, I've just, this is only the beginning, okay? And last, last week I promised that I was going to talk about Romans chapter 5. But I may or may not get to that. Uh, it's down the list here somewhat. Uh, so I even started a column over here. So uh, we'll see. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. Who wants to read that? Okay. There you go. Wait a minute, Beth. We oh, got the talking stick it. there. Hold it for me, please. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And what he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Oh, to 21. Okay. Whereof henceforth how we know man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made in the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Well, you tripped through that King James pretty well there, Beth. <laughs> you didn't stumble at all or spit on anybody. Glory to God. That's what I would have done yeah. with old King James. So anyway, all right, there's so much in that that she just read. I mean, it, you, you can stay on that for hours, that passage of Scripture. But the one I want to, to emphasize is the very last verse, verse 21. And he, the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to what? Be sin for us. He became sin, capital S-I-N. He became that. Why? So that we would become the righteousness of God in him. Now, You've got to understand that your imagination has to get involved with what I'm saying. You have to place yourself in Christ. Your imagination has to be active. God gave you that imagination. Religion wanted to squash it. You need to see yourself as He sees you. In the crucifixion. You are in Jesus Christ. He became your sin. Now, now think about this. If He became your sin, He's the same when? Yesterday, today, and forever. Your sin issue is taken care of. And that was 2,000 years ago. Sin is no longer a part of God's agenda. Jesus took it. Did he not? Isn't that what Scripture says? And who did he take it for? It said all, didn't it? So what about all those people out there? What about half the church? Still groveling on their knees up to an altar, asking for forgiveness. For them too, right? Yeah, he, he did it for them. It's already done. What they have to do is change their mind and understand what's already been done. 
Once we understand what's already been done, now we can be in the new creation that in verse 17. All things become new. If we don't understand it, we're caught in, we're still in darkness. Where the world is and most of the church. Darkened minds. Oh, brother, wait, I'm just an old sinner. No, no, sweetheart, you're not a sinner. That was taken care of at the cross. And oh, that well, well, uh, you know, I, I've got this generational curse. Well, let's look at the next one. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Let's talk about this mess. Christ has redeemed us from what? The curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come into the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus at the cross became sin and the curse of the law. Well, wait, what, what, what's that entail? Well, read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is a legal document. Every legal document have the benefits for agreeing with that contract and the penalties when you don't. These are called the blessings and the curses. The first 14 verses are the blessings. 15 through 68 are the curses. And I've said this before. Ladies, you don't need to go to beautician to get your hair curled. All you have to do is read the curses. Which he became, by the way, and they're gone. They're eradicated. Over. So what's that leave? It leaves the blessings of God. No more curses. Only blessings. How many know that the curses is all about judgment? Of not being able to keep the law. Well, how many know on the cross Jesus became your judgment? <laughs> That's where sin was judged. For eternity. Is everybody with me on this? Because it, it, if you are, you're about 1% of the church. Understand what I'm telling you right now. About 1%, maybe. And then they doubt what I'm saying. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Who's got the talking stick? Oh, there it is. Ephesians 4, verse 8. Real loud. Who's got that? Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Okay, this happened at the, what? The resurrection. Right? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to lead captivity captive? Of where? Hell. Right. Captivity. He took them out of captivity and... and yeah. From, from Adam to now. Let's just, just for fun, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Just for fun. You got that? Jerry, Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Say what? <laughs> What's he got? So he led captivity captive. He cleaned the hell out, and he's got the keys to it now, and I believe it's all boarded up. Amen. That's what I believe. Now, some of you want to say, well, he's going to kick it open for you and send you to hell. Mm. 
Well, modern evangelism has to have a hell to send people to, to scare them into it. But how many know that, that fear is not something that God deals in? That's the enemy's tool. God is what? Perfect love, which casts out all fear. And guess what? It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Not the fear of Him. Not His wrath. Which is His passionate persuasion, by the way. The word is O-R-G-E. And one of the definitions is His passionate persuasion. He loves you so much, He gave His only Son to become your problem. He become what? Us. Living as us. And becoming our sin, becoming the curse. Mm. This all happened at the resurrection, folks. It changed everything. It, it, oh my goodness, took the sting out of, eradicated the law. It's over. Well, what about old Slewfoot? What about Satan? What about him? Anyway, you know the devil's after me again, Brother Wade. Well, let's look at Colossians 2.15. Let's talk about the devil. The divider. The accuser. And by the way, devil is a description of who he really is, and so is Satan. Satan means accuser. Devil means divider. So let's read about Colossians 2.15. Who's got that? Here, here's the talking stick. Somebody help me. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. I like the message, trans Jeff and I like the message translation where he said he paraded them naked before the cross. They were totally defeated. Satan and his bunch, okay? They were defeated. Totally, that's the cross. When he cleaned out hell, they, they had to lead too. And they went to where? 2 Peter 2 4. And Jude verse 6. Somebody. Lil's got it. Or if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Okay, the word is Tartarus, which is another word for the underground. That's where they're held in chains under darkness. Jude verse 6. And the angels would which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Okay, so that's a confirmation. So what does being put in darkness, that's where the only, that's the only access they have is darkness. What's that mean to us? If the devil's after you, where are you? You're in darkness. Because that's, that's the only place he can be. And what does darkness mean? Not knowing. Lack of knowledge. Ignorance by any other means. How many know that most of the people are, have a lack of knowledge of what God's promises are and what he's done and what happened at the resurrection? There's a lack of knowledge. Otherwise, we'd be, we'd be, my goodness, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. Would we? If we knew who we really were in Christ, our true identity that was in Him before the foundation of the earth, before time began, He placed you in Christ. You weren't your parents' idea. You were God's all along, your original parent. So many people think they were a mistake. That's deception. That's darkness. And that's, where, that's, that's the devil's playtime and playpen right there, darkness. What do you think a stronghold is? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 6. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are what? Not carnal, but they're mighty through God to what? The pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and punishing every disobedience until your obedience is fulfilled. So, where do strongholds exist? Everybody go, Ooh, right here. You say, well, Brother Wade, uh, a, a Christian can't have, can't have a demon. Oh, well, uh, uh, do you have strongholds? Or do you have any darkness in your mind? Yes, you do. Many do. But most believers have no clue. And that's why a lot of believers are meaner than two-headed rattlesnakes. That's why church is one of the most dangerous places you can step into, unless you really know Christ. Sometimes you get a cold chill walking in some places. Satan feels more at home than, than, than Holy Spirit. Because he's kicked out years ago. Am I being too hard? So, if they're relegated to darkness, and they were totally defeated, so does anybody have a trouble, trouble with about half the preaching that goes on? About hell and the devil being after you and all that mess? I do. They're preaching before the cross. They're preaching before the resurrection. It's time to get the church beyond this. Into this reality of this life in Christ. You say, well, wait, where do I find out? Well, why don't you start by reading John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. He explains everything right there. The, it's in the upper room with all the disciples. They're all together. And, and, and he watch, starts out by washing their feet, and he begins to tell them what's going to happen. He says, Judas, you go do your thing. Get them out of here. And he tells them exactly what's going to happen. He said, I'm going someplace, fellas, that you can't go. They said, What? We've been following you all this time for these three years, and, and you're telling us now that you're going someplace and we can't go? He said, well, wait a minute now. There's a, another one, capital A, another one who's coming. And he's, got, he's going to be with you, but not just with you. He's going to be within you. Well, do you imagine their minds going boom, exploding? This makes no sense to them. You know, they're sitting there thinking, uh, uh, well, Peter, you know, uh, uh, you're the big boy around here, so I guess you're going to be chief of staff. And then uh, 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 Philip, you know, or uh, I mean, they're, they're looking at this kingdom coming in. He's going to kick out the Romans, and boy, they're going to take over. They're going to whip up on the, on, on the Sanhedrin because those guys are a bunch of thugs. And Jesus is going to take over. And we're going to run this kingdom. Glory to God. Where's this white horse? Well, he had a little foal of a donkey. They didn't really understand until after the resurrection. They really didn't understand until the Holy Spirit came and, and, and reminded them of what Jesus told them in that upper room. And confirmed it. And Jesus played peekaboo with him in his resurrected body, didn't he? Didn't he? One minute he'd be there, and the next, it's like a mother trying to train the, the, the baby. Uh, I'm here whether you see me or not. Because as soon as the baby doesn't see, you know, that's disciples say, where did he go? You know, he's, he's playing peekaboo with him. Glory to God. I'm here whether you see me or not. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So, here we come down to Romans chapter 5. Now, I told you about Romans 5. I told you that if, 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 if Paul's letter to the Romans were an island, and I wanted to just take a, a fly over and just see the landscape of Romans chapter 5, which, by the way, is the doctrine of the church. In the middle of that island, there would be this mountain peak, 
And Romans chapter 5 would be the mountain in the middle of the island. The highest point of that letter. So I'm going to give you Wade's interpretation. Real quick. That all of humanity hangs on the belt of one of two atoms. Atom number one. Or the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Two worlds living together in one planet. Those who are in darkness and those who have been enlightened by truth. And what Romans 5 says is that you're either in one camp or another. And the very first few verses in Romans 5 talks about this thing called tribulation, doesn't it? That those early believers understood the purpose of tribulation. And they would glory in tribulations. Now, who wants to glory in trials and tribulations? Well, let me tell you about these two worlds. When they collide... There's going to be sparks. There's going to be a confrontation. There's going to be tribulation. But the, the world of Christ always is superior to Adam. Always. So without the confrontation, without the tribulation, there'll be no conversion from those who are in Adam number one into the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, most of the church, you know, the Hornings know how, know, know how about the confrontation. Their whole ministry is about confrontation. Getting people out of Adam number one into the Jesus Christ. But most of the church, you know, wants to hide from the trouble. Wants to hide from the confrontation. They've got a frown on your face. Let's read this. Uh, verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by Holy Spirit who has given to us. All I'm doing is setting this thing up about verses 12 through 21. We need to glory in those confrontations and in that tribulation. The early church did. They'd be standing there together and one of them would knack the other one in the ribs and say, get ready, it's coming. Trouble's coming. Tribulation's coming. Glory to God. May the glory of God be seen in me. When do you need faith? When things are going well? When things are going smooth, you know, you're just... Or when things are getting tough. When you're getting pushed back a little bit. A lot. When you're getting criticized. Condemned. Lied on. Accused. Yeah? So, you know, that's what tribulation does. It's coming. It's here. And they gloried in it because they knew that in their weakness, He's going to demonstrate His glory and His strength in them. I can stay on this for a long time. We need to understand this. We need to glory in the confrontations. We ought to expect them and enjoy them. I love to see people's eyes go, I never knew that. I never saw that before. Anybody else like to see that? They hear the truth and, whoa! It's marvelous! It's marvelous! They begin to understand just a little bit, just, just a tiny bit of, of the love of God that has been poured out in their hearts. And it's transforming. It's transforming. They learn to love themselves. <laughs> they need to know that, hey, this thing's not all about you. It's not all about self. It's about others. That was Paul's testimony. He said, look, you know, 
<laughs> I'm going to be whoever you need for me to be just so you will find Christ. <laughs> so in Romans 5, I'm going to read just two verses in that section. I'm going to read 17 and 18. I might read a little bit more. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. If I know Adam, Adam number one. Okay, there's Adam. Huh. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. How many men? All men. And everybody agrees on that, by the way. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, they all say, well, you know, we're all born in sin. Well, I say, no. No, your design, well, you were, God did not create a flawed design in you. We inherited a darkened mindset from Adam. It's not our design that's a problem. It's the mindset. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to how many men? All men, resulting in justification of life. Hmm. So, Adam or Christ, darkness, a distorted view of God, the old image, that, that distorted image of who you are in Adam, or this life of, of a new identity that you are in Christ. It's who you are. You've been declared innocent. You've been declared righteous. Nothing that you have done or will ever do will change what has happened at the cross. The result of the resurrection. I'm going to say that again. Nothing you have done or will ever do is going to change what happened here and what happened to you in the resurrection. It's over. It's done. There's no more to do. He said, te telestei. It is finished. That was not hyperbole. That was not exaggeration. That was truth. In Matthew 5, 17, says, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy. I came to fulfill. And He did. The law, the prophets, oh yes, including Daniel, it's over, done, complete. Sign off. Does, is that what fulfilled means? Yes, it is. Glory to God. Finished means what? It is finished means what? It's finished. It's over. Done. Done. I, I want you just to, to settle in on this for a second. Because religion has taught, no, 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 you've got to qualify. That, that this gospel is an if-then proposition. If you do this, if you do, then God will do that. No, He's already done it. I'm sorry, that's a lie. That's a religious lie. Perpetra Satan's fingerprints are all over that. That, that. that came right out of the realm of darkness. I know I'm stomping all over people's toes right now. But I'm telling you the truth. You might as well come out of darkness yourself. Out of the twilight, come into the blazing light of truth. His glory. See yourself for how He sees you. Glory to God. Okay. So what did this do for you? What does the resurrection mean? To you. We already talked about your sin being gone. 
We already talked about the curse being gone, so all you can do is float in the blessings of God. Hallelujah. You're in Christ now. Who knows, who could quote to me Galatians 2.20? For I am crucified with Christ. You are in Him at the cross. I am crucified with Him. Nevertheless, I live. I'm, I'm alive and dead at the same time. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Once we understand this, that we're not here. You, this is not about me. It's about us. Christ in me. It's about a partnership. He lives in me. He lives in you. And the more we become to realize this, the more effective we become in the kingdom. Those ideas that, that pop in your head, those aren't your ideas. They're inspired by Holy Spirit. He wants your imagination just to explode. Adam had all kinds of limitations on him. In Christ, there are no limitations. Unlimited possibilities. He's never placed any limitations on what you can do or what you can have. What religion's done is squash your imagination. But he wants to revive it, glory to God. That's the first aspect of revival. Seeing who you really are in Him opens up all kinds of doors and windows and, and freedom. Glory to God. You might even raise your hands in worship. Who knows? Who knows? You might even say, Hallelujah. A little squeaky voice, Hallelujah. Bless God, you, you know, watch out now, you might even start running. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh, we don't do that in our church. Hmm. Well, praise God. All right, Jeff, got you. Hallelujah. What else did he do? What happened even before the cross? 1 Peter 2.24. What happened when he's on that whipping post? He bought your healing. He bought your healing. Bought and paid for. Done. I know we pray for people, but we're, what I'm learning to pray for is for the eyes of their understanding to be enlightened that they will come to know what it is that you're already healed. You're already delivered. You're already made complete and whole. And any message that you hear that says something other than that is a lie. Anything that says you have any lack whatsoever is a lie. It negates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you ever say, well, I'm just an old sinner, all you've done is negate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what you've done. You've ignored it. Set it aside like it's meaningless. And you've taken on the law like you have to do something to earn it. And compare yourself to others, by the way, while you're doing it. Oh, my, Wade. Oh, by the way, our address is 1210 Illinois Avenue if you want to come hang me. If you want to get, get a mob up and come after me, that's all right. All my religious friends. I'll be happy to debate you using this. I'll be happy to talk about Scripture only, only, only if you allow for me to pray with you for the baptism of Holy Spirit in your life. That's the, that's the caveat right there. I'll have any kind of a conversation with you, a debate, if you will, if you'll first of all allow me to pray for the baptism of Holy Spirit in your life. Ho, 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 whoa, glory to God. 
I almost did a flip. <laughs> what about this one? What's that say? What it says is, go ahead. Yeah. What, what? Oh, there, it there it is. Go ahead, Dave. It says, Don't you know that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Amen. That's what Paul said to those Corinthians. Yeah. They were having all kind of trouble. And he says, hey, fellas, don't you know that you're the naos? What he was referring to was the tabernacle in the wilderness, which had the three parts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The naos is the holy of holies. Don't you know you're the holy of holies where the glory of God dwells? Oh, that's who you are. God's glory is resident within you. Mm. I said, wait, I don't feel like it. I don't care how you feel. <laughs> your feelings don't have your best interests in mind. Christ does. Holy Spirit does. He's proven it. He's proven it. Uh, what else I got here? Oh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I'll just, you know, I, I'll summarize it real quick. That you were placed in Christ before the foundation of the world. Before time began... God's idea was for you to be in His Son. That's His, His plan from before time began. The conversation the Trinity had. We're going to create mankind and we're going to place them in us. They're going to live in us to demonstrate. They're going to have these bodies and they're going to demonstrate my love to each other and love us. And it's going to be a continual romance forever and ever and ever. A aeons. From vanishing point, this is how Hebrews think, vanishing point to vanishing point. We're going to have this romance. We're going to dance together in this, this love affair. That's God's plan. Are you dancing with Him? Are you loving Him like He loves you? Mm. Learning to? Mm. We haven't got, quite got there yet. Like Paul said, I haven't quite apprehended, but man, I'm, I'm, one thing I do, mm. yes. I've set my sights on His love. And then here, He's proved it. He says, I made you alive together. He's, made, he, he's raised you up together and He's seated you together in heavenly places in Christ. You have now, you have the ability to see from a life from a new perspective. You can have his vision now. You can see the way he sees things. And then you can call it into being. Romans 4, 17. Using daddy's language. Calling those things that are not as though they were. This vision thing is, 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 is part of going higher. Starts in your imagination. This revival of the imagination within us. In the Hebrew mind, and I'm about to close, in the Hebrew mind, the imagination is called the making place. The making place. Praise God. Has this helped anybody tonight? It helps me just to go through my notes sometimes. Higher. If I, if I begin to quote scriptures over and over again, there's a reason I'm doing that. I want it to be drilled into you. I want this thing to become like it's your nature. Not second nature, it's you. You become to, to know this reality. To know Him means that you've had an experience in Him. And I want us to go, to, not for mere information, but to know Him. So we grow in understanding Him so we can remember. The word remember means to take an event from the past and make it a present reality in this now moment. Praise God. So Father, tonight, let what's gone on, what has gone on here tonight, let it become a memorial pillar for us. Let these words begin to sink in and become us. Let us assimilate. Let us eat your word and become this living epistle. Thank you, Father.
for this reality. And those that are here and those that are watching, so much so that, that lives will be transformed never to be the same in Jesus' name. God bless you to be a blessing to others. Stay tuned with us. In 15 minutes, we're going to start up again with discipleship class. And Connie is going to be teaching on the old gate. The old gate. God bless.